Do you follow health and wellness professionals on social media spaces? If you do, you may want to tune into this week's episode because there's a lot of information about herbs out there and I want to make sure that you know how to use them. Join me this week as we take a look at herbalism, how it works, and how it is unlike the current allopathic medicine model. Early on in my life, I had it in my head that I had to work as hard as my male counterparts in order to be successful. I sprinted as fast as I could in the direction of my goals, rushing off all the signs of fatigue that my body was giving me. I didn't have time to stop, or so I thought. I quickly found that the pedal to the floor pace that I was working so hard to achieve just wasn't sustainable. I started getting sick a lot. My cycle was a mess, and my mental prowess was quickly disappearing. When I learned more about my cycle and how it gave me certain gifts, I was a bit skeptical at first. The idea of stopping during my bleed sounded like the opposite of achievement to me. Once I started planning my work with the phases of my cycle and the strengths that I have in each phase, everything changed. If you want to learn how to be more productive, improve your energy, all while reducing period problems, join me for Cycle Productivity Secrets on October 24th. We will learn how the cycle works, how you can use it to harness your superpowers and feel healthier and more vibrant in the process. Being more productive with less effort sounds like a win to me, right? Join me today. Space is limited. The link is in the show notes. And now, back to the show. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are, I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. Today's podcast, I'm going to riff a little bit about a concept that really bugs me. And I think as I go through this episode, you're going to find yourself nodding your head and going, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, I didn't realize that's what that was. And so that's exactly why I'm doing this episode, because I think that it is really important to raise awareness around this particular concept, because and today I'm talking from my herbalist hat. So there are a lot of people who have become disenchanted with the system. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably one of them. This disenchantment with the system has led us to reach for more holistic and natural ways of improving our health and well-being, which I think is really positive because we live in a culture where last time I checked the numbers, 20% of our gross domestic product was spent on acute care, meaning after something has already started not working properly, and only 4% is spent on prevention. Let that sink in for a second. That's huge numbers. And again, I'm in the United States. I'm talking about this in terms of gross domestic product in the United States. But if you look at Western culture as a whole, you're going to see that this is something that's really kind of seen across the board is we really wait until shit starts to go sideways before we go, oh crap, I need to do something about this. Instead of being mindful and caring for ourselves all along, which reduces and in some cases eliminate the potential for certain types of pitfalls as we go along through our lives. 
So thinking about it from this perspective, I want to talk about herbalism and the fact that our Western culture has this mentality that there is a pill for every kind of symptom. So if you have high blood pressure, you might get lisinopril. If you are having anxiety issues, you might get Lexapro or Wellbutrin, right? There's a pill that goes with the symptom. And I see this in my practice all the time. People come in the door and they're like, well, I have this thing. What can you give me for that? That's literally the words that come out of their mouth because we have been so entrenched in this understanding that if you have a symptom, there has to be a pill or a thing that is going to address that symptom. And I highlight this because it is very much is a mentality thing, right? This is how we talk about health in Western culture. And in some cases, I'm starting to see herbalism being treated the same way. So have you gotten an idea of what my gripe is yet? <laughs> I'm talking about the social media posts that I see. This isn't the only thing, but this obviously I saw one this morning and it lit me up. So here we are. Social media posts going, this herb is good for this on social media. And I see them a lot. As somebody that works in the health and wellness space, I follow lots of accounts that like work in the same vein because I totally believe that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? If we follow each other and we support one another, that we can really start to create some change around mindset in our culture about what wellness truly is and what health can be. And that there are a lot of places that you can stop on that route before you get to, I need to take a pill for this, okay? And in some cases, people do. I'm not demonizing. All I'm saying is that we tend to do the pill option first as a first line of defense or response to whatever it is that's going on inside of our system instead of going, okay, so what is the cause for what is going on inside of my system? And maybe that's the part I should work at instead. So I see lots of social media posts that are like, willow bark is good for headaches. Okay, because obviously I work in the women's health focused space. So we talk about headaches a lot and for a lot of reasons. And, you know, willow bark, here's this beautiful image of willow bark and its Latin name, which I will totally butcher if I say it out loud. <laughs> Salix alba, I think is how you pronounce it. But anyway, I am really horrible with pronouncing Latin. A lot of times I can spell it and I can't say it. But anyway, headaches can be solved with willow bark. Well, okay. So the lay person who is scrolling through their feed because they're trying to follow people who work in the wellness space and they're trying to learn as much as they possibly can because they want to feel empowered. They want to not feel like they are at the mercy of whatever the symptom is, right? We're all guilty of that. We all want to be able to take our life into our own hands and say, I have a solution for this, right? That's what empowerment is all about. And when I see these posts that say things like willow bark is great for headache, well, then you get the lay person who is not a trained herbalist who goes, oh, willow bark is great for headache. And that's the only thing that they turn to for headaches. And in some cases, it doesn't work for their particular headache. And I'll get into the why of that in a second. But if you follow Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, you know, wherever you follow me, you will never see me post about specific herb. And I do that intentionally. I think that sharing plant wisdom is really important and we can all be really empowered knowing 
how our plant allies can support our bodies. It's not that I don't want to share that kind of information with you. It's the fact that I don't want what I'm sharing to be taken in isolation because that's exactly what these posts do. And yes, I know I'm kind of beefing with social media right now. And, you know, it's just because I see things like this all the time. And it does. I get wound up about it. So I figured it would make a good podcast episode because people who don't know the ins and outs of being an herbalist will look at that one post and go, I can use this for everything, not realizing that maybe it doesn't work with certain body constitution. Maybe there are certain presentations of headaches. And I'm going to keep using this headache example as my illustration. When we're talking about headaches, for example, Chinese medicine recognizes there's a bunch of different causes for headaches. If you get headaches in your temporal region, it says something. If you get them in the vertex of your head, it says something. If they're coming from the back of your neck, it could be telling you a story of a couple of things. If it feels like a hat that's on too tight, it tells you a different story, right? So every single way that a headache shows up, and usually there are certain patterns. So if you really sit and think about how your headaches show up, I don't know about you, but mine tend to come from the back of my neck. And they're not like a gallbladder channel presentation, meaning that it's tightness in my trapezius radiating up the side of my neck and then bringing the headache to temporal area on my head. These are like right next to my spine at the base of my neck, and they radiate up over the top of my head, and I just want to push right above my eyeballs in order to give myself relief. From a TCM perspective, that's coming from the bladder meridian. The first one that I described with the tight traps and the tight neck, that's a tall bladder presentation headache. A liver presentation headache looks like somebody stabbing you right in the top of the head or you think that there's somebody stabbing you in the top of the head. I mean, and I can go through like all of the different ways that headaches present and what those causes are. But just in that little snapshot, do you see that headaches are more complicated than just quote unquote headache? So one herb does not solve it all. You need to find the right herb for the why. Okay, if you've been listening to this show, you know that I am the why kid. <laughs> I need to understand why things happen. And this is why Chinese medicine makes so much sense in my head. Because it works from this beautiful root and branch theory. And I'll go into that in a second. So you get to the why something is happening in the first place. Which for me as a person was really important. So. I've been really irritated for a long time about this, here is this herb, it does these things types of posts because I know that the lay person who is just trying to learn what they can about natural ways of supporting their body, but they're trying to DIY it, will look at that post and think that one herb is going to solve that one problem. And I want people to be aware that it's so much more intricate than that. And when I looked at all of this, I was like, this is a very like Western medicine kind of approach. You have a symptom, here's a pill, right? You have a symptom, here's an herb. And then I stumbled across somebody, he's a brilliant herbalist. His name is Sage Popham, and he owns the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. I think his work is really brilliant. And he's been one of the influencing schools of thought in my herbal work. And he used the terminology allopathic herbalism. And I had never run across that terminology before, but it just really resonated with me. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what this is. There is an herb for a symptom. And it highlights that specific symptoms have certain herbs that will quote unquote solve the problem. But the part about that approach, so I like this idea, allopathic herbalism. I think that's a really beautiful way to word it. I don't know if that term originated with him, so I can't point to that specifically. But he was the person whose material that I ran across who 
use that term allopathic herbalism, like I said, it really resonated with me because I'm like, yes, that's exactly how this information is being presented. Well, let's take that a step further. There are actually some herbalists that practice that way. And I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent. I don't practice that way. And I believe that there are limitations to practicing that way. But I'm not out here to throw shade. P different people choose to practice the way that they practice for different reasons. But I think that it is more complicated than that. And here's why. Okay, I'm going to go back to that idea of root and branch theory that I was talking about. So when an herbalist is truly working in the most holistic sense, whether they're a TCM trained practitioner or they work with Western herbs, it doesn't really matter what your materia medica is. I'm trained in Eastern, Western, and Ayurvedic herbs, and I still use this fundamental guide point as where I begin when I'm looking at somebody's body and symptoms that are presenting in a body is that there has to be a reason why this particular issue is happening. So why is it happening? There's a root cause for that. Because symptoms just don't show up because they decide, oh, today is a good day. Hey, George, can I make an appointment to show up as somebody having pain in their shoulder? Like, it's not like that. There's something in the body that hasn't been functioning optimally for however long. And maybe it's been a slow creep over a really long period of time. And now all of a sudden you have a symptom that is annoying and distracting enough that you feel like you need to be proactive about it. You might have been able to ignore it before that, but you can't now. And so this is why you're starting to look for a solution to the problem. Well, pain, for example, can have a bunch of different causes. And where the pain shows up can have a bunch of different causes. It can happen from blood stasis. It can happen from emotions getting stuck or energy being stuck. It can happen for a long list of reasons. And so when we look at the synergistic relationship, now we're starting to consider the whole person. So from my perspective, this is the difference between allopathic herbalism and holistic herbal approaches. And I'm calling it holistic herbalism because, like I said, it could be whatever materia medica you work with. But there is an energetic component to it and there is a functional component to the herbs that are being chosen to deal with why the symptoms are happening in the first place. So I love this idea that Chinese medicine practitioners and I mean, really any practitioner that works with herbs, you're looking at the person like a plant and you're nourishing the roots of the plant in order for the plant to flourish. Heal the root. The plant thrives. So that's how I look at my work with herb is, oh, you're having period cramps. Are they sharp and stabby or are they dull and achy? Oh, they're sharp and stabby. Are they all over or can you point to a specific point? Oh, okay. We're talking about stasis. We're talking about blood stasis because you can point to it and it's really sharp and takes your breath away and there is nothing dull and achy about it. So we need to move the blood that is essentially creating a traffic jam on the Meridian Interstate Highway. And once the debris is moved and energy and fluids can move smoothly again, the pain will go away. So we look at why that stasis is happening in the first place. And that is where we go to begin the healing journey for that particular individual. So herbs are so much more than themselves in isolation. And I also kind of want to talk about active ingredients and in herbs too, simply because you walk into any health food store you're going to see shelves and shelves and shelves of supplements, okay? And I could do a whole episode on supplements, and maybe I will. But supplements, my husband literally steers me away from the shelf where you see curcumin now because every single time I see it, I'm like, mm -hmm. and <laughs> he's like, okay, we don't have time for you to get wound up right now, Adrian. But these things wind me up because there's 
not enough understanding collectively. And so people waste their money needlessly and they're doing it with good intentions. They just want to feel better. They just want to heal themselves. The, the intention is good and supplement industry capitalizes on it. And I think that's really awful because the person who's reaching for that Kirkman supplement probably feels like crap and has read some social media post or something on Healthline because Healthline did one article on Kirkman or turmeric. I don't know. I haven't Googled it. There probably isn't an article out there, though, because I see stuff like that all the time. And because it comes out in one of those large outlets, people take that as testament. And it's like, well, hold on a second. There's a lot to consider here. And this is why it's important to work with somebody who is a trained herbalist, because they're going to consider the bigger picture. But the reason that turmeric and curcumin are a thing that wind me up so much is turmeric, number one. Yes, is it great for inflammation? Sure. Does it work with all constitutional types? No. So if you're looking to reduce inflammation, turmeric may or may not be a good solution for you. But the part that I feel is such a travesty and honestly crooked is when you get companies that create curcumin supplementation because curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric that helps with inflammation and cardiovascular stuff, but it does not perform its job optimally when it is isolated. Let's just let that sink in for a second. You are taking a capsule that is a curcumin tablet and it's supposed to help with this symptom, but some of its ability to do its job has been removed because it is not with the turmeric. So people take this and they get marginal results. I mean, sometimes you've got some manufacturers that have the wherewithal to understand that it has to have some sort of an agent to make it do its job, like pippily long pepper or coconut oil or something. But even then, because it does not have the rest of the properties of the turmeric itself, it doesn't function optimally. So you're going to get far more benefit from a curcumin standpoint if you use the actual turmeric than if you use it by itself. This is why when you look at Ayurvedic medicine, and I use medicine and I know that generates a very allopathic mindset, but when you are using it the way that Ayurvedic Materia Medica is used, you oftentimes cook it into things and you cook it into ditches. And there's a relationship there because there's ghee as you're heating whatever the other herbal properties in the thing are, right? So there's a synergistic relationship. The ghee activates certain things in the items themselves to make them perform the functions that are healing and beneficial. So this is why we cannot take things in isolation. The other thing to keep in mind is we also tend to frame herbs like they are medicine. <laughs> They're going to solve a problem for you. But when you look at it holistically, plants are a concentrated form of food. So consuming them as food-like as possible as part of your meal, you know, maybe you're taking it in tincture form or as a tea, consuming it like you consume food is going to give you the best benefits. And when you're looking at it like from a tea perspective, for example, a lot of times formulas, and I deal with this with pelvic steaming also, is I'll have people be like, oh, well, isn't red raspberry leaf great? Yes. It's great for uterine tone, but what else is it that you're trying to do? It's great for uterine chi, but what else is it that you're trying to do? If you're trying to help with circulation, red raspberry leaf isn't going to do it on its own. It's going to need other things with it. And then whatever the formula is that you are putting together 
There are certain herbs that are primary that handle the major functions that you want to create or results that you want to create with the formula. And then there are lesser ones. There's actually four different parts to a formula. And all of those herbs are in there to create certain relationships and catalyze the best of each of these items that are in it so that the formula creates desired results and changes in terms of the root cause behind why somebody has certain symptoms. So I think it is really important, whether it is a pelvic theming formula, because I've seen a bunch of those out there on Etsy and the internet and everything like that, and they are not well thought out, folks. They're just not. And I've seen some that have three herbs that are all in the same family that produce very similar responses, and yet it's packaged as doing a different function than the primary. Like, it's really crazy, okay, what is out there. And I think that's even more reason why it's important to highlight why you need to work with somebody who knows what they're doing because herbs are so potent and they are so beneficial to the body and provide so many gifts to our system energetically and physically but we can't do them in isolation we cannot use herbs allopathically we can't their gifts that they have to give us their healing benefit come from their relationship to themselves So the properties that they hold naturally and then how you use them in tandem or in conjunction or in formula with others and that this combination of things is being done to look at the root cause of why something is happening in the first place, not at the symptom level. The only times that I can think of doing anything at a symptom level is if you've got somebody that has like ascites, for example, which is like fluid retention in a particular part of the body and like a lot of fluid. It's like a swollen sack of fluid. You would need to use something kind of potent in order to help the body to pass, drain, and transform that fluid naturally. But you're still not going to do that one in isolation. But it might be the focal point of what you do first because One of the ways that you can help the plant to grow is you remove excess first. Just like if you overwater your plant, you can kill it that way. If you give it too much water, you think you're doing something good to it, but you could kill it because you've given it too much water. Same thing is true here. If you give it too much of something, not realizing that there needs to be a balance and a harmony and that you can't deal with it at the symptom level. You've got to look at why the symptom happened in the first place. Clear the excess and then nourish the roots of the plant and the plant will thrive. So next time that you are scrolling through social media or you are reading articles in health and wellness spaces, take a look at who the person is that's talking. Are they an MD? And I'm not saying all MDs don't get this. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that we tend to place emphasis as authorities when people have certain types of letters after their name. And a lot of times those people, MDs, you know, are probably one of the places that wind me up the most, that unless they have other forms of integrative health training, they're going to have more of that mindset that there is an herb for a symptom or there is a pill for a symptom because that's their training. Like I said, I'm not demonizing anyone. I'm just saying that you have to look at who's talking and who's writing. Same thing with studies. Studies are only as good as who's asking the question and what question is being asked. Is it being asked because there's an agenda? Or is it being asked because there's genuine curiosity? You know, look at who's asking the question and what question is being asked. And is there an agenda behind it? The more we learn how to critically think, the better our health is going to be, the better decisions we're going to be able to make, the more empowered we're going to feel. Because this is why we look at these posts in the first place. 
We just want to feel empowered. We don't want to feel like we are a quote unquote victim to the symptoms that we're experiencing. And this is where working with somebody who is a trained practitioner can really be a beautiful investment in your long-term health because the really good ones are going to teach you what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how you can help yourself when you're not in their office. Because we have a health crisis in our Western culture. We don't move enough. We don't spend enough time in nature. We don't slow down and stop enough. And we think that we need to fix things with a pill. And all it does is it masks the symptoms, but it doesn't improve the function of the body in a lot of cases. Not in all, but in most. So it's a Band-Aid. It's not dealing with the root cause of why something is happening in the first place. So let's start asking some questions. And great, willow bark worked for headache. But what kind of headache? See how the questions start leading to different answers if you know what it is that you're looking for. Thank you so much for listening to me riff on this particular topic. It's one that does get me kind of excited because I realize just how much we lack information to be able to critically think around certain topics like this. And that's one of the things that if you don't take anything else out of the show, I hope that learning to ask enlightened questions is one of them. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist, herbalist, sound healer, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence, LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment with Adrian for one-on-one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like us and follow Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.